So anyway, I, you know, this, uh, I, I call this uh, dilemmas and challenge, challenges in spine MR. And uh, I probably should have called this thing what I learned. Because just like you, I'm always learning some new stuff. And uh, so I put this lecture together because each one, almost each one of these cases, I learned something that I didn't know beforehand. So maybe they won't be such a dilemma to you, but they were sort of a dilemma to me. So, um, and I learned a lot. So that's what we're going to do here. And we'll have a little fun with this. And if anyone wants to pipe up any time during this uh, presentation, just, uh, just speak into yourself. I uh, know, just uh, speak up. So here it is. Objectives. So I'm going to present some challenging cases uh, in which the diagnosis, or at least a narrow differential, can be made on the basis of the MR findings. We'll establish the proper MR sequences used in the cases and draw attention to specific and important <laughs> MR findings. And then where proper or where applicable, present the correlative uh, clinical and surgical findings. Okay? So I'm going to spend about maybe about seven to ten minutes uh, talking about uh, a technique that is not used enough. And I'm going to kick it off by showing you this particular case, which of course in itself is not very mysterious. I mean, there's clearly a large cyst within the cord and it goes all the ways down here, it's about as far as you can see, it goes off in the T2 weighted image all the ways up to the cervical medullary junction and all the ways probably up to the obex. And we would all call that a syringal myelia or a syringal hydromyelia if you want to be more precise. And we'd all look to make sure the patient doesn't have any tonsillar rectopia, doesn't have a Chiari malformation, and we'd all give contrast when this patient is first examined to make sure that this wasn't some sort of cystic tumor. And when all that is negative like it was in this patient, we're left not knowing why this patient has a syringal myelia. No history of trauma, no prior surgery, no prior infections that were, that were known. And then we look at the uh, sagittal image. Now it's parasagittal, so the cord really isn't this small. It's just sort of partial voluming out of the cord. And we get down to this level here, and we notice that there is this little indentation of the cord. So what's going on here? Is the cord being pulled anteriorly? Is there something pushing on the cord? But we don't see anything that's pushing on the cord. And then we look at the T1 axial image through the same area, and we see the cord. We wonder whether there is some deformity at the back of the cord. So we're going to tell the surgeon that there's deformity of the cord. We don't see any enhancement, and there's no mass pushing on it. Well, what we do is we do a lot of CSF flow studies. And just like I mentioned this morning, in the lecture on spinal trauma, this is a vastly underutilized uh, technique in the evaluation of spine and spine problems. And you know, this is a, a phase contrast uh, CSF flow study. And what I have here is a collage of images, but I'm actually going to show you the cine, the movie clip here in a second. But what you're going to see, go over this uh, beforehand, well, you're going to see some flow in, in the syrinx uh, cavity itself. And this is encoded so that flow in the caudal direction is black and flow in the cranial direction is white. And all this stuff is in the syrinx cavity itself. But our attention will be placed on the flow that's in the subarachnoid space. And what you're going to see is you're going to see discontinuous or uh, disrupted flow in the dorsal subarachnoid space, which corresponds to this area here and here. Basically, what you're going to see is nice flow coming down and until you get to here, and it won't fill. And then when everything else becomes black, this becomes white. And when this becomes dark, then everything else becomes white and vice versa. So that's what you're going to see. And then I'll tell you what was found. Now, I know that this, is, this isn't uh, the greatest uh, continuous cine loop, but I think you'll agree, if you watch down here, that that, like right there, when everything else is uh, iso-intense, even below it, this becomes hyper-intense. And so, and, th and there, I think you saw when that becomes, let me see, whoop, there, when everything else is dark above it, this be, uh, when everything else is iso-intense, that becomes dark. So what do we tell the surgeon? And here is the uh, CSF flow in the axial plane, and you can see this uh, mass, if you will, is pressing on the 
dorsal surface of the cord. So surgeon went in on the basis of this because we thought this represented a loculated CSF collection and, if you will, an arachnoid cyst, and that's what was found. And he went in and operated, and with this scan, a follow-up scan was done uh, very soon after surgery, you can still see that the patient has this subcutaneous fluid collection. So this is, you know, a couple days after surgery, did not touch the syrinx cavity at all, and this whole thing just collapsed. So that speaks a lot about the dynamics of CSF flow in the subarachnoid space and the development of syrinx cavities. And how many times you've seen patients who've had these isolated syrinx cavities and you don't know why, and I say that if you see uh, that kind of thing, a CSF flow study often will show you disrupted, disharmonious flow of uh, CSF fluid. Now here's another case, while the patient doesn't have a syrinx cavity, but it has compression of the dorsal aspect of the cord, and then when you look at this, you wonder, well, is the cord atrophic here, or is the cord being adhesed anteriorly? Uh, you know, is, could there be cord herniation like I showed earlier through a transdural rent? Well, <clears throat> again, here is the cord anteriorly, the cords anteriorly. It looks like there's a little uh, indentation back there. Uh, you can't rely on this too much because we all know there's flow voids on uh, pulsation artifacts, but we can do a CSF flow study. And if you keep your eye on this area, which corresponds exactly to that area, you'll see again uh, uh, flow, which is not in synchrony above and below. And here, when this is dark, everything else is bright. And when this is bright, everything else is ISO intense. And then there is this uh, fluid back here. So here, so we'll look at this there. Now, I know this is, looks a little subtle to you, but when it corresponds exactly to a lesion on the MR or an area of question on MR, be very aware that you may be dealing with an underlying uh, uh, subarachnoid cyst. This is very valuable. That is another patient who underwent surgery and that uh, arachnoid cyst was removed and the patient uh, improved clinically. And the last case along this line I'll show you is this. We've all run into these cases with a little slit-like, well this is not so small, but a little slit-like area within the cord, at the, at, at particularly at the cervical thoracic area, and we don't know what to do with it. No, no uh, Chiari malformation, no mass effect, no enhancement on post-contrast study. Uh, what does this represent? So we, and this is below the level, so you don't see anything abnormal here. Here is through the cyst itself, the syrinx cavity. And what you're going to see, what we did see on this flow study was a totally discontinuous CSF flow. A flow in a subarachnoid space should be a nice column of blackness like this, a nice column of whiteness like this when the flow is in the opposite direction. The vank is set at six centimeters per second. And here you can see that the, that the flow is interrupted and it starts again and it's interrupted in different areas. So, this patient has not as yet been operated on, but we believe that there's adhesions in the subarachnoid space, which secondarily causes changes in CSF flow dynamics, and then the syrinx cavity forms. So you may want to try this. These are standard sequences that are available on almost every modern uh, MR scanner. Simple thing to do, and it gives a lot of additional information, plus they're fun to look at on a cine loop. So what is learned? After each case, I'm going to tell you what I learned. Uh, and what I learned in these cases, and we have many more like this, that CINE CSF flow studies are valuable in confusing lesions of the spine where there is a possibility of altered CSF dynamics, that arachnoid adhesions and occult arachnoid cysts underlie many non-tumoral, non-traumatic, non-inflammatory cysts of the cord. They're explained by mechanical alterations of CSF flow studies. And the last thing, which is a personal opinion and somewhat controversial, but I'll stand by it, is that CSF flow studies in the spine are far more valuable in general than intracranial CSF flow studies. We, don't, we hardly ever do any intracranial CSF flow studies. We do a lot of spine uh, flow studies. So let's look at another case. So here's a 37-year-old man who comes in with s sudden, severe low back pain. And you look at the T1-weighted image, well, it's just your garden variety disc pushing back the cord equina, and you look at the axial T1-weighted image, and there's the 
uh, disc pushing back the thecal sac and probably the dura here, and it's left-sided. And then you do the T2-weighted image, and there is this very strange-looking uh, mixed intensity uh, lesion, if you will, right adjacent to the disc. And, uh, or is it the disc? It's bright. It's brighter than CSF. It's mixed signal just below it. So it, we were unsure what this represented. This is the, what is this thing? And here, if you look at the axial image very carefully, you'll see there's like a fluid level. So this meant to us that this was probably a fluid collection, but we couldn't explain everything. Why would that happen? Why would that be? Here is the, there it is a little bit below that. That's through this level. So we were able to get the prior outside films from three months ago, and this patient three months ago just had your standard protruding asymmetric disc, if you will, with possibly a small tear in the annulus. And so the surgeon went in on the, on the study you saw before, went back in on this thing, and at surgery, a serosanguine cyst associated with a disc fragment, a relatively small disc fragment was found. So this patient's symptoms were really due to the development of a cyst, a hemorrhagic cyst adjacent to a disc fragment. So the disc was removed, the disc fragment was removed, and the cyst was operated. So what is learned from this case? The disc herniations can be, and probably much more often than we appreciate, be associated with focal epidural hemorrhages. So the disc goes back a little bit and causes a rupture of a vein and has a hemorrhagic cyst form, or hemorrhage and then turns cystic. And I believe, this again I'm going to say is an editorial comment, I believe that a lot of the reports that we see in the literature and you hear about and you see yourself of this, quote, spontaneous resorption of disc material may actually be the result of re resolution of small hematomas or fluid collections associated with disc material. It never made sense to me. Maybe it makes sense to you all, but it never made sense to me how uh, a nucleus pulposus, a cartilaginous uh, material, can herniate back, cause compression, and then, uh, and then disappears. It resolves. It doesn't make sense. I mean, especially when you see some of these things that may uh, re get removed from the disk space itself, and I think a lot of what we're seeing are, are uh, areas of hemorrhage uh, that get resorbed as opposed to disk material that get resorbed. And you know, the literature says that they form granulation tissue, and then the granulation tissue nibbles at the disk, and the disk disappears. Well, maybe that's the case sometimes, but I don't think all the time, and probably if this patient that I just showed you going on long enough and that uh, cystic lesion, which was a partially hemorrhagic serosanguinous, resorbed, people would have been talking about, hey, this was a spontaneous resorption of the disc. Wasn't that patient lucky? Well, that, I don't think that's the story in most cases. So let's look at another case, an elderly male with uh, back pain and progressive incontinence. And when you look at the T1 and T2 weighted images, what's uh, striking here is that there's loss of height of the vertebral body, the disc spaces are relatively normal, uh, you know, given the age of the patient, clearly there's desiccation of the disc, but there's no uh, bright signal within the disc, and the thing is dark on T2 and on T1 weighted image, and then there's a bright signal behind it. And then when you look at the axial gradient echo image, basically the disc is uh, the disc. The bone is dark with some areas of bright signal within it. And so the question is, is it's what's happening here, because you'd expect that if this were a metastasis that was causing dark signal or a plasma cytoma, that this would be brighter on a T2-weighted image, and there'd be possibly more loss of height of the vertebral body. You can see here that whatever's happening in the vertebral body is going back into the posterior elements. The other thing you'll immediately notice is this soft tissue mass that's coming back out of here, and it's pushing the posterior longitudinal ligament back, and it's going in the neural foramen, and it's going in another neuro, other neural foramen, it's extending into the pedicle and into the posterior elements. So note the low signal on T1 and T2 weighted images and extension in uh, and T1 and T2 weighted images. In most of the vertebral body, 
but also with extension into posterior uh, elements and no extension under the posterior longitudinal ligament. So the differential diagnosis here to all of us would be probably a, maybe a plasma cytoma, metastasis, a vertebral hemangioma, which may be aggressive, or Paget's disease. And then when we look at the plain films, uh, more carefully, we notice there's expansion of the vertebral body from anterior to posterior, and so now with this uh, cotton wool type of appearance, we think that this is Paget's disease, and in fact, what this was was degeneration of Paget's disease into an osteosarcoma, and that was that bright signal that you saw that was extending back out of the vertebral body into the soft tissue. So this was an osteosarcoma uh, secondary to Paget's disease. And why do I show this case? Because Paget's, <clears throat> Paget's disease is not all that uncommon to see in the vertebral column, so we always have to worry about uh, degeneration into a sarcoma. So what do, what's learned in this case? Beware of that type of degeneration, and that hypointensity in the bone on T1 and T2 weighted image indicates the presence of a highly uh, dense, probably va uh, calcified matrix, and the high signal is pr the fibrovascular component in the active area of the process. So now here's another case. Here's a patient, a 50-year-old man with bilateral leg weakness, and this was not actually done in our institution, but sort of referred to us for a second opinion, and I looked at this thing, and this is the T1-weighted image pre-contrast and post-contrast, and I said, well, this is most likely an ependymoma. I mean, a mixopapillary ependymoma, which is uh, somewhat bright uh, on a T1-weighted image, like they are, and then it enhances vigorously, and there it is in the, in the spinal canal, and then on the T2-weighted image, there's probably cis or necrotic areas surrounded by low signal, which could very well represent areas of old bleed, and we know that ependymomas bleed, so that's what it probably is, but that's not what it was. Here is the same set of images. The differential diagnosis is ependymoma, which I thought most likely arising from the phylum. A paraganglioma could be in the differential, but you'd expect a highly vascular tumor like a paraganglioma to have flow voids associated with it in the spinal canal, and it's not there. Some sort of vascular malformation, but that would be very unusual, or a neurofibroma. It was a plexiform neurofibroma, and I show that because look how large this thing is, and we usually think of neurofibromas or schwannomas uh, being relatively, you know, dumbbell-shaped lesion and rel one segment, but these can get huge when they're plexiform, just like in the skin or subcutaneous tissues, they can arise in the spinal canal and grow to a large size. So <clears throat> here's another patient, severe myelopathy, progressive over two years. I'm going to show you a T1-weighted image, a T2-weighted image, and a post-contrast study, and just think about what you would diagnose this to be. The first thing, of course, is to decide whether this is inside the cord or outside the cord, and it's a little difficult on the T1-weighted image because you don't know whether this is the anterior or ventral aspect of the cord or whether it's part of the um, posterior longitudinal ligament or whether it could actually be venous structures, but here on the T2-weighted image, it becomes clear that whatever this is, is causing the medulla to be humped over it. So this clearly, at this point, has got to be some sort of extramedullary intradural lesion. And the question is, what is it? So here's the quick, goes all the ways down to here. And I'm going to show you the, well, when you see this at first, you think, well, could this be like an epidermoid? But look at this, post-gadolinium, this thing enhances around the edge, and there's areas of cyst or necrosis within it, and on the axial post-gadolinium study, this is a little confusing, but this is the mass itself, and this is what remains of the medulla, and this is down in the cervical region, and this is the cord pancake back here, and this is the enhancing lesion. So <clears throat> we have big discussion with the neurosurgeon. They wanted to make this some sort of uh, intraspinal abscess. But you'll notice that this patient has no prevertebral soft tissue, has no discitis, no osteomyelitis, uh, and the patient was not constitutionally sick. 
Uh, <clears throat> so here was the differential diagnosis. Intraspinal abscess, infected epidermoid. I mean, what else would uh, cause such enhancement in an epidermoid? Couldn't be a plain epidermoid. An infected neuroepithelial cyst, an infected neuroenteric cyst, or a cystic schwannoma. Well, the diagnosis was a cystic schwannoma. So what is learned from those two cases? That nerve sheath tumors are mimickers of many different types of spinal tumors. Uh, they can be included in a, a bunch of differential diagnoses uh, <clears throat> outside the spinal cord itself, and that a single nerve sheath tumor uh, within the spinal canal can grow to enormous size. So we have to throw out from our minds the traditional uh, concept of what a schwannoma or a neurofibroma looks like because these can get huge. Okay, 17-year-old with a three-week history of neck pain and fell one day before admission uh, and, because, and was admitted for an unsteady gait. And here are the uh, images. I'm going to show you the T2-weighted images here. And so now we can go back to this. And so the first thing you notice, obviously, is this lesion is not exactly the same signal intensity as CSF. It's sort of like a, a dirty-looking uh, CSF. And the question is, does it arise from the cord, or is it in the uh, subarachnoid space? And this very sharp margin sort of tells you that this uh, is probably arising in the subarachnoid space, although it could be arising from the surface of the cord. And then you do the... Um, and you can see here that there's really no enhancement. Then you do the T2-weighted image, and you see here again this very well-circumscribed lesion. Now you're more convinced than ever that this is probably growing into the cord as opposed to growing from the cord. And what's the differential diagnosis and what's the diagnosis? Well, arachnoid cysts, I guess it's possible, but uh, they're usually elongated and they're posteriorly located. They almost always start in the posterior or posterior lateral portions of the cervical canal. It would be very unusual to have an arachnoid cyst, that is a congenital cyst that arises between the leaves of the arachnoid uh, there. A neuroenteric cyst, well, you would expect to see bony abnormalities of the spine, uh, which are like a, a segmentation anomaly, and there was none in that patient. An epidermoid cyst, uh, these do not have such a smooth contour. You know that these, from seeing them in the posterior fossa or in the supercellar region, have sort of like irregular, bumpy contours to them. And neuroepithelial cysts, which are smooth, thin-walled, non-enhancing cysts with nearly CSF intensity. These are usually in the ventricles, but maybe in the subarachnoid space. And this was a proven neuroepithelial, or what's called an ependymal cyst. Those words are interchangeable, and there you can see them both used. Uh, so what is learned? Well, we're used to seeing or thinking about these epithelial cysts or ependymal cysts uh, originating within the ventricular surface or intracranially, but they can arise in the spinal canal, and they may simulate arachnoid cysts. So this is a part of the differential diagnosis. If you see these things anteriorly, think of an ependymal cyst or a neuroepithelial cyst. Um, they may arise from ectopic ependymal cells, or uh, which are either on the cord surface or within the subarachnoid space. We also learned that it's just not the ventricles and their linings that are home to these ependymal cysts, but they may uh, occur in the spinal canal. And that very surprisingly, and it is amazing, and I'm sure you have the same uh, uh, you know, feeling every time you see masses that are this size and what how little is left of the spinal cord, that these patients can uh, continue to function at a near normal level. Uh, it shows the plasticity of the spinal cord uh, and, uh, you know, if adaptive mechanisms that the cord has to transmit pulses through, geez, where is the cortical spinal tract here? And, you know, where's the spinal thalamic tract? I mean, and this patient really was doing well, probably had this ependymal cyst for, for 10 years, 12 years. So that's what was learned. How about this case? Intense progressive low back pain in a patient with a quadraquinus syndrome. 
This is a T1 and T2 weighted image, and you can notice in, uh, these bundled up roots of the cord equina, and what's left of the uh, cord equina is encased in this high intense signal in the subarachnoid space. And of course, this extends or comes from the vertebral bodies at L4 and L3. The important observation here is that there is no high signal within the disk space, nor is there apparent erosion of the cortical M plates. So we would tend to think that this is not a, uh, any kind of inflammatory process, infectious process. If you look at the coronal and axial images, what you'll see here is this large paraspinal mass and paraspinal mass embedded nearly in the psoas muscle. So the, the bells start ringing, you think, oh, well, this is tuberculous spondylosis, then it's skipped the disc space, and it's a paraspinal mass, and it's pushing on the psoas muscle. So you come up with a differential diagnosis. Could it be metastasis? But with this degree of involvement of vertebral body with no evidence of collapse, probably less likely. No other lesions. Plasmacytoma, same story as metastasis. A paraspinal neuroblastic tumor, such as a ganglioneuroma or a ganglioneuroblastoma, is possible, but uh, again, unlikely. Lymphoma, TB abscess we went over, or primary bone tumor, and is common uh, when you put up a list, the last one is always the one that's the answer. So this was a primary bone tumor, and what was it? This was a chordoma. And uh, what is learned? Now, I don't know how many chordomas you've seen. We've seen quite a number of these, and they can be very bizarre looking. Uh, chordomas are not necessarily just a one-segment bony lesion. They can be multiple segment lesions, they can have a large soft tissue mass associated with them, and they can jump at this space and spread into contiguous vertebral bodies. And so always think of a chordoma. It's part of the differential diagnosis of uh, one of these types of abnormalities of the spine, whether it's cervical, thoracic, or lumbar. It's unusual, but it happens. So here's a middle-aged man with progressive motor and uh, sensory loss and he has cranial nerve involvement too. And as we look at the post-contrast study, the first thing you think about when you see this post-contrast study is this sort of coating of the back of the cord and the anterior portion of the cord, and you begin to think of drop metastasis or, uh, uh, or a, a infectious process or TB or sarcoid. But then when you look at the axial pre- and post-contrast images, you'll see that actually what's enhancing here is not the cord or the cord surface itself, but the nerve roots. And what's particularly uh, 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 striking here is the dorsal roots are enlarged to a greater extent than the ventral roots. So look here at the C2 level. They're enhanced, the roots, the ventral and dorsal roots are enlarged, and they're enhancing, but the dorsal roots are bigger. The dorsal roots are bigger here. And then by the time you get to the mid-cervical region here, the roots, it's a conglomerate root going out the neural foramen. So when we look at the T2-weighted image, the same thing. It's sort of a striking picture and one to remember. Uh, ventral root, dorsal root, and then at this level, they conglomerate because they're so big, and the same thing here. So clearly, we're de dealing with some sort of nerve root problem, whether it's an inflammatory nerve root problem, an infectious nerve root problem. And then we look at these, uh, the brain, and you'll notice that on the post-contrast study, there's intense enhancement of V5, the cranial nerve 5, OK? And there's intense enhancement of 9, 10, and 11 going out through the jugular foramen. And in fact, in the brain, you'll see this enhancing area. Uh, uh, well, not enhancing. This is on a flare image. There's a bright signal on the flare. And then on the um, post-contrast study, there's no enhancement, but there's still clearly abnormal signal on a flare image. So this was a case of chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. And we are imaging more and more some of these uh, hereditary polyneuropathies or post-inflammatory polyneuropathies. And it brings up a differential that I'll go over in a second. So what's learned in this case? 
the case like this, which is chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, or SIDEP, just to make it simple, uh, <clears throat> despite being a motor sensory neuropathy, can also present with asymptomatic white matter lesions of the brain, which appear is, uh, identical to MS plaques, and that this uh, particular entity is distinguished from Guillain-Barre syndrome because in this particular entity, you have both ventral and dorsal root involvement, and you know that Guillain-Barre is a motor problem, and you would expect to see enlargement of the ventral roots uh, predominant over the dorsal roots, okay? So the differential diagnosis, and I don't know if you get to examine many of these patients, but uh, Guillain-Barre is an acute inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, whereas this entity that you just saw is a chronic one. So this comes on acutely, and you're usually, from a clinical standpoint, uh, not uh, a lot of question about it. They're a fairly classic presentation. However, sometimes if the patient has a mixed motor and sensory deficit, uh, on those few occasional uh, times, they will get an MR scan, and you'll want to know what it looks like. It looks a lot like the case I just showed you, except, again, the ventral roots predominate. predominate. Then the, there's the whole group of hypertrophic neuropathies, but these affect more the peripheral nerves and the corda equina, like Charcot-Marie Tooth and Desjardins Soto, neurofibromatosis. Uh, could be, but they tend to be asymmetric, and so we're left with this. So you'll recognize these hereditary or inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathies. So let's look at this case. 67-year-old man with progressive upper extremity weakness and, low, uh, and loss of sensation and recent onset of hiccups. And of course, you can see the high signal within the cord and the hiccups, of uh, which is often a very... Um, ominous sign, in, as you know, in neurology to start getting hiccups uh, because that means that the medulla is involved. And uh, here you see this high signal, see high signal diffusely within the cord, and uh, <clears throat> the observation that's important here is on the uh, dorsal surface of the cord where you see all these little tiny bumps, and everyone here probably realizes that this represents vascular structures along the dorsal aspect of the cord, probably venous structures. And so the uh, <clears throat> belief then would be that this patient is suffering from some sort of vascular malformation, most probably a dural uh, arterial venous malformation. But the question for us as radiologists is where is the fistula itself? That's important to uh, to try to find out. So the patient gets a post-contrast study. This is pre-GAD. This is post-GAD. And you can see clearly all these vessels on the posterior surface of the cord all the ways up to the cervical medullary junction. And you see, can see enhancement to a mild degree within the cord itself and enhancement of these veins because of the slow flow, and this is a post-gadolinium study. So there's veins along the posterior surface of the cord. So we do a lot of MRAs. We do a lot of spinal MRAs, and uh, this is uh, the MRA post-gadolinium injection. This is usually done as a double or triple dose gadolinium uh, with the source images in the sagittal plane and then reformatted into a coronal plane uh, as you see here, and on the coronal uh, reconstructed image, you'll see this represents veins on the posterior surface of the cord, and that's these, and there are veins on the anterior surface of the cord also. Again, the question is, is where is the fistula? Is it here? Is this a, a vein coming in at the C1 level and the fistula is over here? Well, the patient eventually went to uh, digital subtraction angiography. Here's the <clears throat> early phase of a carotid arteriogram, and you immediately see the vessels coming off the cavernous carotid, feeding a fistula, and you'll follow this down. This represents a draining vein, and the draining vein goes down <clears throat> into the spinal canal along the anterior and post -surface, posterior surface of the cord, and this these are the veins that you saw on the post-gadolinium MRA and that you saw in the routine MR. 
and <clears throat> this is uh, cause venous hypertension and secondary high signal changes within the cord. So why do we show this? Because, well, first of all, it's a tentorial vascular malformation with caudal venous drainage, and there's venous hypertension resulting in ischemia of the cord and in the medulla oblongata. So what is learned from this case? That spinal cord symptoms may be secondary to an intracranial dural AV fistula, and as a corollary, that uh, in spinal venous hypertension, the angio may have to include the brain. So it's usually when we see this constellation of findings, that is a high intense signal in the cord and big veins along the posterior surface of the cord, you use a spinal MRA because uh, it, it, you do a spinal angio, catheter angio, thinking that you'll find it there, but you have to oftentimes go up into the brain because the fistula may be draining down from a dural fistula above. Uh, and that a, a dural AV fistula with flow into spinal veins has now been classified as a type 5 dural AV fistula. There used to be only four types of uh, spinal vascular malformations, and now this is a type 5 dural AV fistula. Okay, let's take a look at this case. It's a 50-year-old woman with a progressive myelopathy. And on the post-contrast study, everyone here would say that this represents an intradural, probably extramedullary mass, which is compressing the cord, and this was vigorously enhancing, and this could be a meningioma, it could be a neurofibroma, I guess it could be some sort of drop metastasis, it could be some sort of other um, lesion, and on the post- uh, or, or on the T2-weighted image, you can see the cords being compressed as a, a mixed signal uh, within it, but it's basically a dark signal with some areas of high signal within it, and here's the axial image. You can see veins draining along the anterior surface of the cord. So the, the close inspection, however, of this shows that there is also enhancement all the ways to the ventral surface of the cord. So now you worry could this be an exophytic lesion arising from the cord, growing out into the subarachnoid space, or is it a lesion arising in the subarachnoid space, growing into the cord? So this is the only intraoperative ultrasound I'll show, but this is the lesion. And so this is the intact dura. This is the probe put in the fluid bath. As the lamina were removed, this is the dilated subarachnoid space, and this is the cord, and you lose it here. And on the other end, this is on the opposite end, okay, this is the caudal end, here's the mass, clearly in the subarachnoid space, here's the cord, but you never see a nice clear plane at this level between the cord and this mass. This mass has a dual echogenicity to it, uh, representing some areas of uh, probably uh, necrosis and a more compact tissue. The surgeon goes in and operates, opens the dura, and there is this intradural extramedullary mass, but as he dissects down further, finds out that this actually arose from the spinal cord itself, so this was an exophytic tumor. And there is it after it's been removed, and this is this fleshy mass, and this was an exophytic ependymoma. So what is learned? that a mass which appears typical of an intradural mass may be primarily intramedullary and may be growing in an exophytic manner. And we're used to seeing that in brainstem tumors, aren't we, where you see a brainstem tumor that grows exophytically and, and envelops the basilar artery. Well, you can have these exophytic tumors quite dramatically in the spinal canal. Intraoperative ultrasound saves the day in many types of spinal surgery, and that helped the surgeon in this case. And that to be a primary intradural mass, a distinct plane or margin between the cord and the mass should be evident on at least one view of the MR, and that was never seen. You never saw a, a clean margin on anything, on any view. I mean, you may not get it on every view, but on, at least on one view. So that's what's learned. So we're getting to the end here. Here's a 55-year-old man with slowly progressive asymmetric weakness of the upper extremities, right greater than left, and wasting of the muscles of the right arm. So here is the uh, T1-weighted image, and what does everyone see here? Clearly cord atrophy here. Cord is normal size here. And then there's this little slit-like area in the cord. 
What does this represent? Here is the axial image through here. The cord is atrophic. It's lost its normal bulbous anterior contour. And in the paracentral area of the cord are these two areas of darkness, which correspond to this. So clearly something is happening in the region of the lower motor neurons in the gray matter. And on the T2-weighted image, the same thing. So you look at this and you say, well, this could be an old infarct, I guess, with uh, the cords now atrophic, but he never had a incident like that where he had a sudden onset. This was a slowly progressive over years and years. And so what we're looking at is a degenerative process of the uh, uh, gray matter of the cord. Analogous to what you see in ALS, except this is a more slowly progressive, and it's a lower motor neuron degenerative disease, and here on the T2-weighted image, you can see the high signal within the cord, the cord's out here, so this is primarily in the gray matter, it's greater on the right than on the left, and this patient's symptoms were greater on the right than on the left, and this is... Hariyama's disease. Now, I'm, nobody cares about that particularly here, but to recognize that this is, whatever the name we want to give it, is a, um, is a type of a spinal muscular atrophy. Anyway, it's a lower motor neuron degenerative process, and these patients often get examined by us and by you because the clinician is worried that there may be something that's compressing the cord, that's causing this progressive neurological dysfunction, and you see this, and you have to think of a degenerative process of the cord itself, and it's in the gray matter, and the differential diagnosis is an old cord infarct, prior trauma, which there was none, a prior infection with a neurotropic virus, like an arbovirus. But anyway, and here is, how about if you were presented with this? This is not the same, it looks the same, but it's not the same diagnosis. And this is what? This is post-polio syndrome. This patient had polio as a child, and, uh, you know, they go years and years uh, fairly static, and then they begin to go over the hump where they lose some more neurons as you get older, and it's just enough to throw them over the edge. And this is what a post-polio syndrome looks like, okay? No, no old cord infarct, and this is not Hariyama's disease, whatever that is. But anyway, this is post-polio. You can see the high signal within the ventral uh, horns of the cord. What is learned from that last case? That there is a variant of spinal muscular atrophy, which may be predominantly unilateral, the degenerative processes of the cord. A primary consideration when there's high signal in a small cord with no prior history of trauma, surgery, or infection. So we have to look at that carefully. And the location of the signal abnormality on an axial image can narrow the diagnosis. Uh, and here, the diagnosis was a disease of the motor neurons. 35-year-old with a two-month history of back pain. The reason I show this is because what this is going to turn out to be is the earliest changes of uh, diseases which when they go on, become more flagrant. And here is a parasagal image. And we all know when we look at the a large stack of films, we tend not to pay as much attention to the paraspinal images as we do to the midline and paramidline images when we get out laterally. But there's a lot of information on here. And here you'll see on the T1 and T2-weighted images a couple of things. Here at the region where the annulus fibrosis attaches, into a region of Sharpie's fibers, there's a low signal on T2. Notice the difference between this normal area and here. And then on, T, on, on T1, on T2, it's bright. Then here, where it's bright on T1, it's iso-intense here. And then you go all the way up here to around the T5 area, and it's dark here, and it's bright there. So something's going on at the level of insertions of... Uh, of uh, various ligaments into the vertebral body or in or the annulus where it attaches Sharpie's fibers and this patient had a history of bowel disease and maybe now you know what this is this is uh, seronegative meaning the patient does not have a rheumatoid arthritis but it's one of the seronegative spondyloarthropathies and bowel disease ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease can often present with these type of spondyl, spondyl, uh, spondyloarthritis or arthropathies, and this is an early manifestation. Even an early manifestation 
of ankylosing spondylitis or psoriatic arthritis. So here you can see this lesion is T5, and that's up here, and it goes back into the pedicle. So what is learned? The careful scrutiny of parasagittal images is critical, and in the ca just case I just showed you, you can see both active and inactive posterior spondylitis at the vertebral body edge at the level of the disc and ver vertebral bodies. And uh, when there are hyperintense lesions like this, uh, question the possibility of inflammatory bowel disease as part of the differential diagnosis. And the STIR images are particularly valuable in these type of cases. So this is the last case, honest to God. 30-year-old woman with positional headaches. And we all know that when there is a, a history of positional headaches, the patient's worse when, it's, uh, when they're upright and they lay down, they get a little bit better, and this, that we all worry about intracranial hypotension and a CSF leak someplace. And the reason I show this case uh, is because when you do an MR exam on these patients, there is a false localizing sign that makes you think that the leak is at the C2 level, and this is very, very constant. So here is a T2-weighted image. You can see the dura, and there's a lot of high signal fluid around the dural sac, and you see the same thing here in the parasagal image. So this is like cut through here, and you know you shouldn't see this amount of fluid back here. It's a false localizing sign, and this has been described in a number of articles and in the AJNR also more recently, that uh, if you think that the, uh, that the leak is where you see a lot of fluid, you may be misled. So you've got to look at other areas. And here in the lower area, you can see that the fluid is not only leaked out into what will be the paraspinal region, but anterior to the dura. So this is fluid out here also. So where is the leak? That's a false localizing sign. And now, oftentimes, uh, we do, and I'm sure you do too, you have to do a, um, a myelogram, a water-soluble contrast myelogram, obviously, with CT to follow, and to find the level of the leak. And here we found the level of the leak at the C7, T1 level, out through the neural foramen, uh, a ruptured perineural cyst, undoubtedly, was probably no history of trauma. And you can see that this fluid leaks, and it goes anterior to, this, to the dura and in the epidural space. And then it uh, is around the back of the uh, dorsal dura here and even leaks into the paraspinal region. No wonder this patient has positional headaches with all this fluid leaking. So the patient was explored at the C1 uh, at the C7 T1 level, and the surgeon told me, no problem, just put glue on the dura. Okay, glue. What is learned? That a CSF leak can appear to be localized at the C2 level or at MR, but the leak is at a remote site. That the leak is very often overlooked uh, <clears throat> as a cause of significant headaches of relatively recent onset. And the initiating incident causing the leak can be relatively minor. Uh, there's all sorts of histories of somebody taking a vigorous golf swing and has a tremendous headache and could, nothing will uh, alleviate the headache. And it turns out these patients have intracranial hypotension and CSF leak. And they probably initially had some sort of perineural cyst that a relatively minor accident or jolt caused a rupture of that perineural cyst and now they start leaking uh, CSF and our job is to find the leak. Okay, I promise this is the last case. This is a good case. I'll just tell you what the diagnosis is. 28-year-old woman with acute uh, severe right arm pain, and this was a little confounding initially, but it's an important diagnosis to make, and I'm sure all of you have a good idea of what this is. Uh, this is the dura. This is the dura. This is the cord, and you know that if somebody has acute pain and uh, uh, acute compression of the cord, something has to be done immediately. And this, of course, is going to turn out to be an acute epidural hematoma. And it is a mixture of both acute blood, which is dark on the T2-weighted image, and probably a leak that's a little bit older, so she may have been bleeding for a while, and then underwent a, an acute exacerbation of the bleed and compressed the cord, and that is uh, acute epidural hematoma, and what is learned, Mark heterogeneous 
heterogeneous signal on a T2-weighted image, think of an acute subacute hemorrhage. Uh, the clinical urgency is to establish the diagnosis of acute bleed so the cord can be decompressed and the need to clearly identify the dura in order to establish whether this is intra or extradural. So I'll quit here. It's been nice uh, talking to you. I hope you enjoyed these cases and maybe learned a little bit from it. Thank you.